Hello, welcome to the Atlantic Council. My name is Melinda Herring and I'm the Deputy Director of the Eurasia Center. We're thrilled to have so many people joining us today and this evening for a discussion about priorities for investment and rebuilding the Donbass. This is a discussion that's co-sponsored with our friends at SIPA and Donbass Gates in Mariupol, Ukraine. It's the third in a series of discussions about Ukraine and we're planning to have some more in the fall. If you'd like to participate in the discussion, please use the hashtag Future Ukraine. You can submit questions on Twitter, or if you're in Zoom, go ahead and use that Q&A function at the bottom. Now, it's my great honor to introduce our moderator, one of the best broadcast journalists in Ukraine, Natalia Gumiak. She's not only a journalist and an author, but she's the founder of the Public Interest Journalism Lab, which promotes constructive discussion about complex social topics. From 2015 to 2020, she headed the independent Ukrainian broadcaster Hermatska TV and the English language station Hermatska International. She specializes in for, uh, reporting about foreign affairs and conflicts, and she's the author of an important new book called The Lost Island, Tales from Occupied Crimea, which features six years of reporting uh, about Crimea, and it's going to be published in German and English very soon. So it's my great honor to turn it over to Natalia. Thank you, Natalia. Uh, so, good to hear everybody. Uh, thanks a lot for such an introduction and I'm uh, very happy to uh, host this uh, discussion and first of all with those incredible uh, panelists. So, we have with us Dr. Gennady Chizikov, who is the President of the Ukrainian Chamber of Commerce and Industry. Uh, you have Hans Libovitsky, a founder of Promova, who've done incredible research and had been doing incredible research on the Donbas uh, during the last years. Uh, Dr. Alvidas Medalinskas, who is a deputy director of the Donbas Gates, uh, a political analyst and uh, at Mikolas Romeris University. But I want probably uh, to mention that the Donbas Gates is a Ukrainian NGO based in Mariupol which is joining international and Ukrainian experts in order to find the best solution for the social economic development uh, in the region. And as well, Jock Mendoza Wilson, who is a director and international and investor of international and investor relation at system capital management. And uh, according to the rules of the Atlantic Council, it's not just a statement, it should be a vibrant discussion. Uh, so we start, uh, we don't do the uh, opening remarks so we, up to the questions and i please want everybody to participate uh, and uh, the first question would go to jock um you know i think like we've seen each other uh during the Mariupol Forum, uh, it was uh, last autumn, uh, there was quite a big event. There were 12 memoranda signed, there were lots of investors. It sounded as something new. We know that after that, there were less forums. Uh, you know, it was pre-COVID times. Uh, so um, what, are the, what are the real results? In what it ended, uh, especially, you know, uh, there were all those memorandums were linked with international partners and investors. Uh, but what happened? Did disagreements uh, are concrete at this moment? Uh, it's a good question. I think uh, you're right to hi highlight the Mariupol Forum on the 29th of October last year. Uh, it, it drew together 700 guests from around the world, uh, many who had previously not traveled to Mariupol because of security concerns. So I think it was an excellent initiative on behalf of the president to draw the attention to the real situation in Mariupol, which is positive, and not to the rumours which tend to circulate. However, and, you know, and it was really positive in terms of the international community being there, the investment community being there, the memorandums that were signed. And the fact is that perhaps without the intervention of COVID, things would have moved along much faster than, we ha than they have. But essentially, four months has been lost because of that global crisis. At the same time, investors are nervous about investing during the time of COVID when in fact their cash flows are, are difficult, their focus is on maintaining their existing businesses, ensuring as quite rightly as a priority that existing businesses continue to operate and employment continues to be in place. That doesn't mean to say nothing's happened and I mean it's good that we're talking about this today because perhaps one of the uh, biggest announcements to come at Mariupol and then to be followed up on happened today. Uh, Deputy Prime Minister Rezinkov uh, with uh, the French ambassador today announced the 64 million euro investment in the new water treatment plant for Mariupol, which is a direct follow up from the actions at the conference. And that's going to provide clean drinking water and improved uh, infrastructure 
uh, into into Mariupol. So I think that is a major signet uh, deal being signed. Uh, another deal that was signed uh, in advance of Mariupol and has been followed up since then and is now moving towards a construction phase was one of the businesses in our group, Metinvest, that signed an agreement uh, with the French company Elikid to construct a gas treatment plant, which will create industrial gases. That's a $78 million investment. And in the construction of that gas plant in Mariupol for industrial gases is going to create a thousand jobs. So the fact is that uh, while it has been slower than anybody would have wished to move from the drawing board to uh, application of investment projects, it, it has happened. And I think honorable mention should also go to that other Normandy partner, not just France, but also Germany, which could, has continued to invest heavily in building capacity in decentralization, which will significantly help the east of Ukraine, as it will all of Ukraine, in bringing decision making much closer uh, to the community. So I think that we can say progress has been made, not as much as we would have expected or wished, but there have been reasons for that. But you know, the big problem for investors still remains the overall investment climate in Ukraine itself. And we would have to say, and it's been well reported, that issues such as one, um, the failure to respect renewables tariffs, which is in which with the largest single area of foreign direct investment in Ukraine has created many bad headlines and amongst analysts and investment committees in businesses a concern that will the government deliver on its promises. And then secondly, in the last two weeks, we've had another negative headline story for investors which affects Ukraine overall but impacts on the East, which is the instability in the leadership of the NBU. So we have had recently, since January, two large negative stories which undermine investors' confidence in the robustness of the Ukrainian economy, which really reduces their appetite for taking that further risk if they come to Ukraine, of going further east to where investment's most needed. Um, I would go to Dr. Uh, Gennady Chizikov. Um, we really all don't want that the COVID-19 would be an excuse for not making everything, because I think that the region like the Donbas suffered a lot for all these excuses, uh, the, the legitimate excuse for because of the war, we can't get the investments. And now on top of that, we have the, the pandemics. But still, uh, can you say how has COVID-19 impacted small and medium sized business in the Donbas? How unemployment has risen? And what are the what are your concerns? Thank you very much. Uh, Donbas is a very interesting region, not only by uh, to the situation with the uh, war, but not only uh, any situation. But uh, uh, COVID-19 and uh, quarantine measures was uh, introduced by the government, of course, uh, impact uh, in, uh, very, uh, very much on the not only uh, in Donbas, but in, in general in Ukraine, first of all, on the small and medium sized businesses. Uh, as you know, the, during a couple months was uh, closed the uh, do, uh, doors of the uh, restaurants, cafes, uh, spas, and uh, entertainment uh, uh, organization, etc. It was quite uh, Im important for businesses. I gave you only one figures uh, in, in uh, uh, headdresses. What is headdresses? It's uh, nothing practically. It's a very um, it's small business, very small. But if we, can, uh, we calculate for one month uh, the role of the uh, the role of the headdress in uh, economy, minimum one billion uh, grivnas. It's quite big. Uh, we, uh, this is very important. But uh, first of all, the uh, Ukrainian uh, small and medium size uh, uh, in this situation was in very bad situation. Small and medium sized uh, businesses don't have a so named strong wheel of, of financial security. That's why uh, the situation with small, business, uh, small and medium sized business was not so good, in Donetsk especially. If you say about the uh, it's an, unemployment, if uh, according to the statistics, uh, official statistics, the unemployment in the, in the country was ne uh, nearby 8%, 8 in uh, Donbass. Uh, always was last years was uh, bigger and nearby 14 percent but we we speak only about the uh, if i can say about only official uh, economics but we know the role of the 
uh, unofficial economy in our country is quite strong. That's why, according to the uh, experts, the unemployment in uh, this region, first of all, between small and medium-sized businesses and uh, uh, in general, nearby 20, 22, 25 percent. It's uh, quite big. It's quite big. That's why the uh, uh, situation uh, with COVID uh, uh, push the situation in the not right uh, direction. The unemployment increased. Uh, the situation became uh, not so positive like it was before COVID. But at the same time, but at the same time, uh, I'd like to emphasize what the uh, small and small and medium-sized business uh, and the role of the small and medium-sized business in the Donetsk region became in, in Donbas became more stronger. If I uh, I can uh, remind, uh, on five six years ago, a so small business in Donbas region was practically uh, zero. Um, nearby, uh, the role of, of this business was nearby eight percent. Now, increased more than twenty percent uh, in this region. That's why, from my point of view, we have a negative and positive uh, impact. We have the role, what the role of the small and medium-sized business in this region became more stronger and stronger. At the same time, uh, the government, uh, in, uh, uh, in central government and the regional government should pay more attention how to protect, how to uh, support small and medium-sized business, uh, because unemployment is quite big. Uh, first of all, uh, to uh, assist to assist uh, businesses, small and medium-sized uh, small and medium-sized businesses. What I mean, the how to save a uh, working place. Uh, according to uh, uh, we, uh, we understand what the, uh, to save one uh, working place is a uh, minimum in five times uh, cheaper than to create uh, in the future a new one. That's why it's quite important. Thank you. Uh, I would thank you, Gennady. I just want to ask our participants to ask your questions. We would have 15 last minutes for answering your question, but if you send them earlier, I'll be happy to address them. Uh, because I think like there are some uh, some some of them which uh, we all have in our mind and we can get into this discussion earlier. Um, I want to ask Alvidas uh, because in December of last year the EU launched a program aimed at providing financial for small and medium-sized uh, enterprises in the government-controlled area of the uh, Donbas, and uh, they it called uh, financist. Uh, certainly, of course, COVID nineteen have had an impact. I think like a lot of programs hadn't been launched but have we seen activity of the interpreters in the Donbas applying for leases and loans for small business I want probably also to say that why I want to address this concrete maybe more narrow question rather than general we can speak a lot about the general things but then a program is created and we want to know is it usable because that's kind of the, that's how the, the, the things are, are, are done it's not about the talks but deeds well it is well, uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. I think that certainly such kind of programs are very much important. And then we have is that EU, also USAID, are launching uh, various programs which are specifically directed towards Donbass. Maybe some of other regions in Ukraine are not happy about this, saying why in Donbass. But really, I think in Donbass, the question is uh, much more uh, important. It's not just economical development. It's also the question about security and stability in this region, and that means security and stability for the whole Ukraine. Uh, when you're talking about this EU exact program, Finance East, so I would say that almost half of uh, those money, uh, uh, around the uh, 30 uh, million uh, uh, euros, uh, were already given uh, to the small and medium em enterprise, even very small business. And what I'm very happy to say is that this is really the program which is done by the EU, but it's done with the help of the uh, state bank, uh, the German uh, state bank. And that is one of a very good, uh, let's say, uh, some kind of uh, uh, examples how real estates could help also uh, for the investments. Now, just you know, distributing this kind of loans for uh, business in the area, but maybe this kind of uh, state banks of various EU countries might come up to this region uh, with some programs which really supported on the government level that the business from the EU, those countries would come and all the insurances, uh, business insurances questions and everything 
uh, would be sold out, understanding that the, these investments are not just economical investments, but also social economical investments. But of course, uh, it's very important uh, to provide two, uh, to send very, two very uh, strong and important messages to the rest of the uh, countries in Europe, in particular in Western Europe. One of them, uh, the war, or what's reported really, that's going on in Donbass, it's really covering the territory about 30 kilometers all around this gray zone, uh, whatever, from the dividing line. The rest of the territory, Donetsk and Luhansk Oblast, is the same normal territory as uh, the rest of uh, Ukraine. The second very important message uh, for Western community, uh, it is that Western investments are not something alien to this area, but sometimes Putin's propaganda would like to portray as a Russian world. Uh, the roots are so deep with the European and general Western investment in this area, that I would say they are one of the deepest in Ukraine, looking to various regions, except of, of course, uh, Western uh, Ukraine. Because at the end of 19th and beginning of the 20th century, the investment from such countries like France, uh, Belgium, Germany, Britain, even United States uh, came up. And I would say only Belgium contributed about five and a half billion euros uh, for the development of that area. Alvides, thanks a lot. We'll get more on the um, investment again, uh, but I want to uh, pass to uh, Yevhan, uh, because Yevhan, um, for the last years, it was for a while said that, you know, we can show the examples, especially in the non-government, in the government-controlled territories, uh, and, and people there should uh, understand that the life is better, that people in the non-occupied territories should understand that. We're coming this year in the municipal elections, the local elections, and probably that would be exactly the example. But really, is it the moment when we think that there should be some new new institution built or big infrastructure projects because here in ukraine i feel that often it's said like security comes first what is what is in your opinion can some things like the big project had been done uh unless the security issue is sorted out um i don't believe in um uh some kind of magic solution uh, where you can have uh uh, one stone and it hits all the birds. Uh, I think uh, it's more sophisticated than that. Um, when we are talking about big infrastructure, the um, uh, key issue is usually the jobs and uh, making sure that local supply chains work. But it's long, not only about that, you know, people come uh, home from work and then what do they do? Um, you know, what is the cultural scene uh, for Donbass? Uh, how are people um, um, spending their time? Can they go somewhere? Can they uh, move around the country easily? Uh, can they uh, enjoy the, um, uh, for instance, freedom of speech uh, to the extent that they enjoy it in other areas of Ukraine? Can people have um, the uh, competitive politics that they have in other areas of Ukraine? And uh, when we're talking about quality of life, it's not only about income and it's not only about money. And when we're talking about competition um, uh, for the minds and for the hearts of the people between the government control and non-government control territories, it's a much wider spectrum of issues than uh, uh, investment, than jobs, than, than actually um, uh, having money uh, there. In my opinion, uh, other areas, the soft areas, are neglected. And in my opinion, um, uh, there was not enough done uh, in terms of culture. And when we're talking about culture, I would broaden it to include ed education. I would broaden it to include uh, human mobility. Uh, most of the residents of Donbass have never been beyond Donbass. And um, you know, when we have uh, uh, the lowest level of um, human mobility, we can't talk about uh, uh, healthy atmosphere where people wouldn't believe fakes about, um, for instance, malice intentions that people of uh, other regions of Ukraine have towards them. Or um, when we don't have first-hand experience of um, other cultures or other countries, it's very easy to, to seed um, doubt in, uh, uh, for instance, 
uh, good intentions of the European Union or uh, explain that uh, others actually do care for, for the success of uh, Ukraine and for success of Donbass. So in my opinion, uh, we have to talk about much broader set of issues than we are actually talking about. It's not only about the economy. Uh, Yevhen, thank you. We already have the question from Marie-Louise Beck, uh, which kind of follows a bit something which was shortly men uh, mentioned by Jock. Uh, I will read it. It's how can we ask German investors to invest in Ukraine when the president is straight hurting a stable, stable politics uh, of the central bank, asking for inflation. Similarly, even Ukrainian will leave the country for safe Western economies. Uh, I would ask you all to uh, re refer to that. Uh, that is a discussion, but probably want to ask also uh, Gennady, uh, generally, um, and anybody who wants to uh, respond, Alvidas, Jock, Yevhan, um, still, uh, how can Ukraine convince foreign investors to invest in the war-torn region with dodgy courts, uh, you know, and in this political environment? Is really Donbass special, or uh, maybe the whole idea is about, like, the, the court system, the national, you know, the un Ukraine where we have the stable national bank? And what would your response respond, for instance, to a person like Marie-Louise Beck, if she would ask. I would ask you to speak to speak Gennady. I think okay. you... No, uh, uh, Don, uh, Donbass region is a, uh, a little bit special for me because I, I, I was born in this region, I worked in this region, uh, and I looked for the history of this region. And Donetsk uh, was uh, always quite in, in interesting for investment in this period of time. Uh, and the main competitor of uh, we, uh, this region was Kiev, uh, Lviv, and Dnipropetrovsk, the Dnipro region. And of course, after the situation in uh, this region with, uh, when the war started, uh, and uh, of course, the, uh, we needed to see this region a little bit different eyes. First of all, uh, we need to understand was the future of this region, of course, not uh, uh, very clear if we will see by uh, old uh, glasses. We always uh, consider the Donetsk region, the Donbass region, uh, like a region of the iron, metal, etc. The heavy industry. The role of this region was more than 20% of the industrial output. Now we understand the situation is changed in change or in general for Ukraine and for this region. Uh, and I see uh, that uh, very important uh, uh, input was uh, in uh, Mariupol. It was uh, one year ago, it was quite interesting moment when they, a lot of, a lot of, like uh, Jock said, uh, a lot of, a lot of businesses and uh, ambassadors and foreigners never visited before this region uh, open eyes for themselves. Uh, Whoa, well, it's quite interesting. And now this region, only 20 kilometers from, uh, from the front line uh, uh, with their uh, Nava territory, uh, and uh, it's very close to the war, but at the same time, uh, according to my information, according to the information of Chamber of Commerce we have in this region, uh, the small and medium-sized businesses looking for a new place in this region. And uh, we speak about the small investment, not about the big investment, small investment. But at the same time, we can say about the also uh, big investment. As uh, also Jock mentioned, the uh, French in, uh, investors decided to, to, uh, to spend some uh, uh, 60, more than 60 million euros in uh, this region uh, for purification of the water. It's a very good idea just to attract attention to the Mariupol. It's a say, well, uh, the city where it was the worst water will be the best water and to create some new image of this river, the very old. Uh, also, but interesting, uh, nearby, I, this is just a couple hours ago, I uh, decided to check. I called in Mariupol, I called in the uh, Kramatorsk and contacted with my colleagues and said everything is okay with the idea to creating of the industrial park nearby the uh, in the, in the Mariupol. Yes, twelve companies, uh, eleven companies from the Turkey and one Ukraine company decided to invest uh, and to create some new businesses here. Yeah, wow, it's very interesting. Despite the situation we were, we are uh, believing this region. We believe in the future of this region. Okay, maybe I'm a little bit optimistic, but at the same time, 
uh, I see that the future of this region very much depends on the uh, in general situation in Ukraine uh, and the creation of the uh, um, trends in this region as well. Uh, from my point of view, a lot of, uh, not only foreigners, but first of all, Ukrainians who lived in this region, uh, who, if I can say, don't afraid this region, would like to come back uh, some of their uh, industrial um, opportunities in this region because they understand what the advantages of this region. Uh, there are a lot of the very good uh, level working force. This region don't afraid industrialization. We understand this is a region with a, a different culture. And uh, it's not so far from Europe. It's not so far like uh, China and uh, Vietnam, especially in this uh, time or period of time of when they, a lot of uh, countries in the global world decided to change big map of the uh, pro uh, productions and a lot of companies now are thinking uh, how to ch uh, move to their production from uh, Ukraine. That's why from my point of view, uh, despite the situation with the uh, war in the eastern part of the uh, uh, critical situation, uh, but the uh, interest of this region, yeah, uh, yes, but uh, this region is a part, oh, sorry, it's a part of the Ukraine and we, of course, for me, like a president of Chamber of Commerce, for businesses, Ukraine business, very important, the general climate, uh, in uh, what we, of course, depends on this one. I probably also want the others to reflect on that because I think it's quite usual to have the discussion about the conflicts and given examples, and I'm speaking about all kind of the forums, that we have the situation globally when there is a conflict but uh the country the investors are coming uh so it, it, it's it, it's not a must that they are not there but especially the situation with the rule of law can be very critical i would still go back to the uh, question of marie louise back uh, probably because it's asked many times by different people so uh jock yavhan alvidas how often are you asked how often are you referred with these questions if you don't mind, may, may I have a, an attempt at answering that one, Natalia? Yeah. Um, you know, I think that it's a it's very competitive climate for investment uh, in Europe and globally. Uh, it, German investors are very interested in Ukraine, um, but like all investors, they, they seek about four key points, which is certainty of the environment they're going to invest in. They're looking for stability and they're looking for clarity, and they're looking for rules. Um, one of the problems that we have consistently in the macro investment climate in Ukraine, I will drill down to Donbass in a minute, but in the macro investment climate is a lack of stability. And in difficult times, the he negative headlines that are created by elements like not respecting investors' agreements in renewables or uh, uncertainty in the independence of the, the National Bank questions around uh, devaluation of the currency. All of these create an environment of uncertainty, which investors simply don't like. And so they may choose to invest in other areas, despite the many marvelous aspects in terms of quality of labor force, access to the European marketplace, techno technological skills, IT excellence that Ukraine has to offer investors. So if you've got negative headlines, every day in the Financial Times and other media. Unfortunately, it changes the perception of investment in the country. And although you get great performance, like for example, Ukraine's performance in the East of Doing Business Index, where it's now 64th out of 190 countries, those sort of performance improvements are, are good, but unfortunately, the real life experience of investors may not be as good. And if you can't invest, attract investors into Ukraine, how will you attract investors to invest in the more geographically difficult areas close to the conflict line in the east of Ukraine? Okay, I, I know some policies and so do others that can do that. But the question is, you have to get the macro economy in a good shape. You have to get the communications about the country's opportunity as an investment destination in place and consistent. And if you don't get that, you're not giving yourself the best opportunity. So the answer to Marie Louise is, look, there are great opportunities here. Yes, it is important that your government, and I know that the ambassador, uh, Ms. Feldman, has worked very hard with the government, as have the G7 ambassadors, to say, look, we need this consistent 
process on macroeconomic policy and we need to see, and this is absolutely crucial, we need to see reform of the courts and safety for investors' cash when it comes into the country. So, as my boss would say, they don't arrive with a suitcase with all their clothes in it and leave only with a swimming suit because everything's been removed from them during their period of investment. Okay, uh, Job, thanks. And I would ask from this point, the, 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 the panel is to be short because we have a bunch of really, really great and very different questions. So we can tackle all of them. But I, I think before that, I want Yevhan also to reflect uh, because I think that the issue of the uh, current, uh, I mean, inst instability uh, and political instability and the rule of law is still there. What's your point on that? I think the government is self-defeating in many cases, uh, and I think uh, that's what you get when you get uh, the politicians who are trying to to play it by ear. And um, uh, out of the four uh, factors that um, uh, Jock Mendoza Wilson just uh, mentioned, I don't think uh, a single one of them is uh, granted in Ukraine at this point. But uh, at the same time, I agree completely that for those willing to take a risk. Ukraine is a very rewarding place. In my opinion, um, it all comes down to um, the uh, bigger picture of transformation of Ukraine. Ukraine is going through, at the same time, qualitative change inside. It's building its institutions. But at the same time, Ukraine is also uh, trying to protect itself from the external threats. And I think um, uh, for those who are willing to partner with the Ukrainian um, organizations that are more aware of the risks, that can better understand the nature of the risks, I think uh, certain investments are quite possible. Um, at the same time, I would really um, uh, consider um, uh, being critical towards um, uh, any populist government. You know, we see how uh, populism has defeated itself uh, pretty much anywhere in the world where it's blossomed, you know, be that the United States, the United Kingdom, or Ukraine. So in that sense, um, I think that uh, a lot of uh, resources can be saved on uh, uh, preparing the big events, but uh, it would be much better if we invested these resources into uh, better schools, into better opportunities uh, for the people. Look, you know, uh, uh, locally in Donbas, uh, small and medium enterprises do not have political representation. There are no friendly, business friendly political parties that are elected into local councils or that are elected into um uh into regional um uh, um uh councils and for that reason one of the ways how the ukrainian government had to stop this unfriendly wave was to introduce the the institute of uh, the military civilian administrations so in that sense i would say i would put it this way you know we have to go beyond uh, simple solutions, and we have to go beyond the uh, simple uh, proclaiming that we are welcoming all the investors. Uh, yes, uh, we would like to see the investors, but a lot of homework has to be done before we uh, can actually have them sustainable. I, I probably would go to Alvidas, uh, but you can, you know, join at uh, there is no order. Uh, please interfere into the discussion. Uh, but still for for alvidas by the way i want to promote also alvidas article uh you can uh it's about the uh, european can, roots in the donbas uh if you are a participant of this seminar uh, webinar you can uh, go to the zoom webinar chat and there is a link but alvidas um still what is mo mo more concerning at this point we have three issues we have the general problems with the rule of law in Ukraine. We do have the issues with the security, uh, is in particular for your organization working in, in Mariupol, you can say. Now there is a COVID-19, which in generally will make less investment, not just to Ukraine, um, not even to the uh, war-torn regions. So what are your major concerns and what is your point for optimism for you? <laughs> well, uh, first of all, of course, when you talk about investment, we have to understand that two issues are joining together normally in Ukraine. Uh, this economical development and uh, rule of law, because the most important that investments uh, would be safe uh, when we are done. Uh, but in Donbass, of course, the security issues are uh, coming also. 
as very much important part. So therefore, when you talk about specifics, I would say in Donbass, yes, there is uh, some kind of uh, specifics. And this is, uh, first of all, uh, that still many uh, foreign companies, but even international organizations, do not allow for very persons, experts, to travel to Donbass, I would say to the east from the line from Kharkiv, Dnipro, Zaporizhia, because of the insurance policy. And not saying about, you know, uh, some kind of uh, situation when you are afraid to invest in such territory, which is all the time in the mass media as a conflict zone. But there is also the second issue, very much important one. It is that this region is the one. So, for example, when the courts, with whom uh, uh, our NGO Donbass Gates uh, cooperates, uh, like the courts which deal with the property issues in the, in the legal way, discuss those issues, uh, quite many business people have a property in both sides of the divided Donbass. But legally talking, it is the same part of Ukraine. But normally, if somebody wants to sell the property, to buy the property in another side, which is uh, occupied by Russia, it's impossible to do that. So, therefore, and investments in this region were like an uh, organic mechanism. Donbass was not divided like it's now in, in divided. For example, when we talk about the roads or the railway system, all of them went through Donetsk. So now there are some kind of road system which is do not touch Donetsk. And the railway is also making a big uh, uh, curve and it takes longer time to travel. So way for in, in investments also very much important. But when we talk about the rule of law, again, I will tell very much important. Uh, our Donbass gates very much involved with these issues with our legal experts uh, in relation to the courts, security office, national police. We have a memorandum of cooperation. It's very much important to sit for all of these legal profession people in Donbass and to see how to solve the legal problems which are specific in this area. And certainly, it has to be done also with the help and understanding of such institutions like OEC and other inter international institutions. So, WEPO, yes, Donbass region is much more complex than it is, but I would share the position of some of my colleagues uh, that really there is a strong optimism in Donbass. And we're talking about Mariupol Invest Forum in 2019. And I was in the Kramatorsk Invest Forum, which in 2018. And I saw how optimistic were people on the wishes to develop economics in Donbass. Alvidas and everybody else, I think, like, again, uh, we have the incredible amount of great questions. And uh, they are very much connected. It's a bit of the follow up from what you've just uh, said. Uh, I've deciphered that was Catherine Queen Judge, who is a Ukraine's analyst for Crisis Group. I want to, uh, you listen to her remark that um, when we talk about the economic revitalization in the Donbas, we usually focus on the government control areas for obvious reasons. However, in some cases, repairing the infrastructure of the government control areas uh, means breaking pre-existing links with the areas on the other side of the line of the contact and building new links with other parts of Ukraine. Again, this is understandable, but is there a risk that that this could be make it harder to reintegrate the occupied areas in the future? You can bear this question in mind, but my larger second question, I think it, it, they are related, uh, would be uh, followed by the question from Hans Petter Midtun, who asked, can Ukraine today afford to reintegrate and rebuild parts of the Donbas alone without the risk of destabilizing the rest of Ukraine? How important is international support for successful reintegration on the temporary occupied territories? But also probably while answering this question, I also, this is quite a broad issue. You can pick up what, what exactly you want to answer. Uh, you know, uh, the other question, what also are the obstacles apart from the Kremlin? apart from the Kremlin uh, for their integration, which we understand that the, the, the Kremlin is the biggest option, but I think like it's clear for everybody here. Who would be the first? Uh, I, would try. I would try. I think the big issue is not um, the economy. And I think it's not the infrastructure that runs on both uh, sides of the separation line. The big question is whether there is an alternative to a Soviet or post-Soviet uh, model of governance, whether there is alternative to, to the system that is uh, built around a hierarchy of authority. 
And that's not only the question for Donbass. That's also the same question is for Belarus. The same question is for Russia. The same question is for Kazakhstan. You name it. It's basically the question, is there a way to successfully de-Sovietize a, a big territory with a sophisticated uh, economy, with um, a very diverse population? And uh, we are basically approaching uh, understanding that uh, the uh, key issue is uh, having a plan for big social transformation and that big social transformation doesn't have a plan that plan didn't come from the government that plan didn't come from uh, the major economic stakeholders that plan didn't come from uh, civil society so far uh, so uh, it's um, it's an open question and um, uh, as long as we have no vision uh, we are basically in in the mode when uh, uh, reaction comes to whatever um, um, signals come in, you know, be that uh, particular issues with uh, a lack of jobs or be that particular issues with a broken bridge somewhere, uh, you know, but it, it's not it's not a matter of, of putting an extra patch uh, uh, for, you know, it's a matter of, of having a new design for the society, for the economy, and of course, for the political life. Uh, it's uh, it's 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 it should be it should be approached um, uh, in a complex way. Uh, so uh, Yevhan um, just shortly mentioned that there is an answer, reply, uh, and a comment to your answer from Catherine Queen, Judge. But I won't read it all. It's quite lengthy. We can read it in the. Uh, but but rather, it's they're speaking that some views on uh, some view the truism that people in the Donbas are exceptionally insular or hostile to other uh, Ukrainians. Uh, she's considering this view is unhelpful uh, and she often hear from her contacts in the Donbass is that people in other parts of the country um, are also aren't exactly Russian uh, to visit them or challenge their view stereotypes about the region. Um, that's quite a long story but I would ask maybe we started more or less the issue of the uh, reintegration of the Donbass and I asked about the obstacles. So I, I, I want to hear, I think everybody is, is uh, interested in, from our audience to hear that. I want to hear from Gennady, from uh, Jok, what do you think are the biggest obstacles? Is this process going on? Because there are people who think that it really can destabilize uh, the rest of Ukraine. Okay. Uh... From my point of view, the uh, uh, Donbass uh, is um, demonstrated uh, all the uh, questions what we have in general in Ukraine, uh, but maybe more uh, more uh, more uh, sensibly because we are uh, now in the process of war. But anyway, uh, if no war, it's anyway we will um, uh, how to, uh, meet with this problem in a couple of years. We need it uh, not think about the only the the civilization like Yevgen said, but also about the uh, uh, reconstruction of all our economy. If you see to the, our neighbors, uh, the country like Poland, like Slovakia, like any countries, this is absolutely different. What we uh, what this country was uh, uh, twenty years ago. Do it. Uh, do it was. Do it to to big reconstruction and the big investment, big new ideas what came to the future. We uh, still in stereotypes what we need to uh, support uh, old Donbass with the big tubes of uh, mines, etc., etc. Of course, this is not uh, the future of the Ukraine and the Donbass. We, if we will uh, sit together and think, what's the future of Donbass? Tubes? No. We need to think about the, uh, maybe robotechnics is the future of this region. Maybe another new ideas in the business, what's the future? And the Donetsk, and Don, oh, sorry, Donbass region should be the part of the global economy, not only the econ economy of uh, Ukraine. This is a part because we needed big uh, and very attractive projects. And the Donbass can be uh, uh, included in the big project uh, when the uh, new ideas in the businesses a new technology and investments uh, quite rapidly, quite fast, change the attitude to the future of this region and the future of Ukraine in general. Um, 
I want to read a comment from Darian Dachok, who says, doesn't this initiative for investing into the Donbass suppose that all sides have already agreed to a permanent ceasefire, or is the purpose of this discussion to prepare all the parties in the event of such a ceasefire? I probably would answer myself for that, but I want to hear uh, the, the uh, you, you understand that this is a discussion in our uh, among our participants that, of course, uh, the, the, there is a discussion to prepare everybody for such a ceasefire. I don't think everybody really wants to have the open battle. Um, so you can go on with the, the question of the reintegration, but at this moment I think that there is another uh, great question from Anders Aslund uh, for Jock Mendoza Wilson. Uh, last year it looked as if Russia was slowly suffocating Mariupol as a port through harassment and inspections of ships, but this year Mariupol's good transportation has sharply increased. What has changed? How did this happen? If somebody else can uh, add to that, uh, you're more than welcome. Okay. Because I see uh, Albert uh, is also not in, um, showing some signs. Yeah. So, uh, in, in answer to, to Andrew's question, uh, I think that what you've seen uh, after we had the incident in the Azov where the Ukrainian ships were seized and there was a blockade put over the Kerch Straits, which we actually saw was a firm response from the international community uh, against uh, Russia's desire to control completely the Azov Sea. Uh, and they recognized that at that point it wasn't worth raising the stakes and going further with an attempt to control that important seaway. And at the same time, there were excellent actions taken on behalf of the Ukrainian government, uh, and uh, which had been followed up, which was one, um, to do something which had been needed to be done for a long time, which was to dredge the channels around Mariupol port to allow access, easier access, and access for larger shipping. That's crucial in maritime navigation, to have navigable larger channels. That's, that was a crucial investment, and that was facilitated by the government who uh, uh, put forward a Chinese contractor who took the risk to go in and, and undertake that dredging. The government also announced a $1.3 billion uh, investment programme into uh, the port of Mariupol. So the government has demonstrated clear confidence in Mariupol in the port of Mariupol, and it's not just been words, it's backed up by actions. And that action has made it clear that that port and, that, and the ability to navigate that seaway will not be given up. So I think that's why we've seen a return uh, to cargoes uh, out to Mariupol, and I think, it, I hope it bodes well uh, for the continued success of the report. And I think the Chinese are continuing to invest in the report, and two further new berths are due to be built. So. I think we look forward with confidence, but it's important that always we take care of that security issue that allows freedom of navigation. Unless there is something particularly want to add, I may also skip you. We have just 11, uh, 10 minutes, and there are some other issues I want to raise. Uh, uh, at it's about the, um, you know, uh, Yevhan mentioned a lot that it's about the new generation. It's about not just the business. Uh, we know, and I think it should be reminded and reminded that the new generation of Ukrainians is growing up in the Donbass, is in the, uh, in, especially in the occupied territories. And uh, according to the data, we have around a quarter of a million of kids living uh, who are in, in teenagers in the occupied territories, including the Crimea. But the figures of the people who entered the Ukrainians' university, uh, for me, it's, it's striking. For in 2016, there were just 885 people. In 2017, 1,346. Mm, last year, that was 1,600 people. It's very little. It's extremely little, uh, small figures. Uh, what do you think can really done for this human dimension of integrating the people? You know, uh, aren't we really... It's not about doing a bit more. It's doing about something totally different. If we want to, you know, uh, have the kids in the occupied Donbass uh, feel like they are the part of the country. Are you asking me? I probably would ask also you, but also Yevgen, I think he speaks also a lot about the education that would be also worth it to me. Uh, you, want, you want to start? Oh, uh, I'll you can start since you're already here. Yeah, okay. Uh, well, first of all about education, because I am myself a political analyst and I am having my lectures in Vilnius and 
hospitals or having sometimes lectures here in the various investments in Donbass. So I have to say that really the education is a guy that's very much important issues in Donbass. And there are a lot of uh, universities, institutes, which really are uh, those universities which were located at the beginning in Donetsk, Luhansk, Gorlovka, Makievka, and now we are in the Ukrainian controlled uh, territory. I think it is uh, very important what EU and uh, USAID are uh, doing to help those uh, universities. I think one of the biggest problems for the reintegration of Donbass will be Russian world uh, concept, which is taught in the uh, schools of occupied Donbass. And to my understanding, if OECE and Western partners are talking to Russia, they have to say, please stop this propaganda of Russian world in the schools of Donbass because it's really serious uh, integration problem. Uh, I would say the culture is also quite developed now in uh, Donbass area. Uh, the theater was opened in uh, Severodonetsk, uh, the theater which was before in Luhansk. There is a very good theater in Mariupol, independent theater in Mariupol by Anatoly Levchenko, uh, who was working in the Mariupol theater. So this also are uh, very much important. But I'll be I would I'll be very this. much important yeah. thing. Uh, looking from economical point of view. We're all talking about the obstacles, Russian obstacles, both in the Kerch Strait, when Russia is doing almost annexation of Azov Sea. Uh, Russia is introducing rubles in the occupied territories. But in order to understand the importance for the Western countries to invest in uh, Donbass, uh, there is very much imp important to look to the example of Western Germany and Eastern Germany. If Russia will not go to the normal way of reintegration, of Donbass to Ukraine and territory. Okay, I'll be just, I think we got your point. Uh, I'll be just, the experience of Western yeah. Germany. Yeah, but Berlin. Uh, I'll, I'll be just, I probably would pass to Yevhen because we really have yeah. a bit le way less than 10 minutes here. I think um, uh, what's crucial is to make the educational system of Donbass competitive. And I think it starts with schools, but later it goes to the universities. If you're looking at the uh, international level quality uh, of quality uh, university in Donbass, it's going to be very difficult to name one. And I think uh, it's another thing that, that should be on the agenda is uh, uh, investment into, into education. Because if we do not have people who can go in Donbass to um, get their education there, it's going to be very difficult to find incentives for people from elsewhere to go into the risk zone, even if we employ, for instance, the frontier approach and, and start um, uh, looking for people who are willing to take risks. Uh, in my opinion, um, if uh, the educational issue is not uh, set as one of the um, uh, um, uh, priorities, I, I think long term uh, there's going to be no solution. So uh, there is an, a question from anonymous attendee, uh, but a great question. Normally the greater the risk, the greater the required return on investment in order to induce caution uh, investors. In view of the great risk that Donbass represent, are returns of say 30 or 35 percent realistic? I probably would ask Gennady and uh, would add another question from John, Shmur, uh, John Shmurhun. What are the main problems that small and medium sized businesses are experiencing organizational skills, human resources, marketing and sales? financing, supply and chain, apart from everything we, we mentioned. Gennady. Yes, yes. Uh, it could be short, yeah. Very shortly. The, uh, I would like to say the, uh, the uh, future of the re, uh, Donetsk, uh, Donbass region is not only the big business, I would like to say. I would like to say about the future of this region, first of all, people, people uh, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, entrepreneurs. We need to believe this region created on the base on uh, uh, entrepreneurial skills, and we need to support this. We first of all, and I very hope uh, uh, the, a lot of uh, programs who what supported uh, small and medium sized business will be sustainable in this region, from international uh, donors organization, from Ukrainian business, from the region, uh, regional, etc. From my point of view, this is a long term uh, uh, distance and. Uh, it's not needed to uh, uh, wait what's in the one, two years, something changed very rapidly. But a lot of, a lot of examples when the uh, small and medium-sized business of this region demonstrated very good level, not only in this region, but in the national region. We lived in the situation 
when the uh, more than 80% of population of Donetsk region never visited uh, uh, Lviv region. And now it's a good opportunity, first of all, for young generation visit to meet to see what uh, Ukraine is a big country, one of the interesting uh, countries in Europe, etc. That's why uh, uh, it's not not needed some something special for uh, business, small business in the Donetsk region. Uh, education, contacts, and the, uh, and they needed to feel what they are big part of the big country like Ukraine. I'm a bit rushing because there is one topic we haven't covered, but I really want Jock uh, to respond. Because there is an issue of the environment. Uh, today, uh, we can't speak that, the, it, it's the, that without having a safe environment, you can really build a prosperous region. And we know the Donbas always, uh, there, was, there were a lot of problems. So there was problems with, uh, you know, now uh, closed mines, uh, the problems with the uh, water pollution and air pollution. It's really the fact, you know, recently one of the companies of Mr. Sakmetov had, had paid Ukrainian quite a bit, big fee, 10 million uh, grievances, but this is like around $30,000 uh, for polluting the air. But in the top uh, 10 companies of the Ukrainian companies which are polluting the air, half of them are belonging to uh, the tech, for instance. Um, how can you really, how can you address that? You know, in fact, because that's something which often missing from the discussion, and especially it's really matter for Donbass. I think it's a great question uh, because you know environment, environment, and environmental policy, the government response, the business response is at the heart of how we'll move forward in Ukraine. You probably know that DTEC is uh, one of the signatories of the New Green Deal. It wants to help move towards zero carbon in Ukraine uh, and help Ukraine meet that European aspiration of that citizen. So yeah, look, many of the businesses that we acquired uh, over the last 15 years were old, moribund, underinvested in uh, former national assets. It takes years to change a former Soviet steel plant into a European steel plant, but we're doing it piece by piece. Sure, sometimes we don't do as well as we would wish, but we're happy to be held accountable for that where we do. And we have a plan with the city of Mariupol and improving investment. We have a plan to decarbonize Ukraine and decarbonize our business and move forward. But it takes investment. And this change in manufacturing requires investment. It requires an access to investment. And that means a clear, open, honest, transparent regulatory framework. Okay. If you want to have clean energy, you need to pay for clean energy. That requires clear, clean tariffs, not confusion. Okay, uh, I think the, 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 the questions for somebody still remain. For the ending, uh, we have very, very little time, but I want to ask you with answer everybody with maybe three words. This year, in 2020, not in the future, but what do you think has the biggest impact uh, to the investment and economic development of the Donbass? You can choose one, you know, or put your order, security, uh, rule of law in Ukraine, or COVID-19 pandemics? You know, like what is the imminent uh, most impactful thing? So I can ask everybody to say that, and then I would uh, move, you know, would close the discussion. Alves, uh, Jok, you're still there. Okay, I'll yeah. just make two, two very quick points. Firstly, I think rule of law in Ukraine will drive investment in Ukraine overall, which will benefit the East. Um, we can only have com real recovery in Donbass, in the whole of Donbass, with peace, but we can have recovery in government-controlled Donbass through rule of law in Ukraine. So let's deal with that one, and let's deal with two peace at the same time so that we move forward with a Ukraine whole and free and sovereign. All it is. Can be with one sentence. Uh, yes, uh, rule of law and security issues. And the third thing, understanding of the Western countries, that investment in Donbass, it means also investment, not only economical investment, but investment in security. People on the other side of Donbass looking for the developments of Donbass in the Ukrainian controlled territory. And if things will go quite well in this territory, like it was in the Western Germany, like it was in the Western Berlin, opposing to the East, Eastern uh, Germany, then reintegration would go much smoothly and much better. Gevhan. Yeah, 
I think, uh, unfortunately, uh, Russian nationalism uh, uh, that basically feeds the whole Donbass campaign uh, from the other side is not going to go anywhere. I think um, the legacy that we have back from the Soviet Union uh, is not going to go anywhere. So I think uh, the uh, one thing we need is we need clear vision and a plan based on that vision. Uh, this is something that helped uh, Central Europe in uh, their transformation in the 90s. I think uh, we should have. I think we should have a vision and a plan. And uh, thank you, Gennady. So, what uh, is has the biggest impact? People probably from outside really want to know. No, uh, I will be very, uh, very, uh, uh, very short. Uh, of course, I am agree with my colleagues. What's first of all uh, for this region and for future of investment in this region very important of course peace safety etc etc but i uh, investment first of all for me it's always people and emotions if we will uh, ukrainian will believe in this region and uh, will support this region it's uh, and ukrainian started to invest in this region foreigners will continue uh, and follow us that's why first of all i believe that this uh, year will be quite important for some identification of the Ukrainian business and Ukrainian business started more and more invest in this region. After where we will see uh, a lot of investors from abroad. Thanks a lot for the discussion. Uh, thanks a lot, Gennady Chizikov, uh, Yevhen Libovitsky, Dr. Alvides Medalinskas, and Jock Mendoza Bilson. I'm passing the final word at uh, the end to end the conversation to. Melinda Haring, the Deputy Director of Eurasia Center Atlantic Council, uh, but ended myself that, yes, we didn't speak a lot about COVID, we didn't cover everything because Donbass and the reintegration of the Donbass and investment is such a broad issue. But as a journalist myself, I would still refer that when the whole world is speaking about COVID, it's a particular COVID-19, it's in particularly critical how uh, and important to understand how the lack of access to that territory impacts real life, because now we're speaking about like, millions of people whom we do not really know what's going on with them and especially about this moment it's very clear to understand that the time is not on our side because you know it's such a global issue so you don't want to have uh, some huge parts of the you know your countries and uh, population not having access to proper health care uh, and now we really understand how critical is that and with that uh, I Thank a lot for your questions. I really appreciate it. Uh, there are a bunch of publications at the Atlantic Council about the Donbass, so follow. And please, Melinda, that's your final uh, comment. Thank you so much, Natalia. One thing is very clear. We all need to get together and have a much larger conversation, hopefully in Mariupol after COVID lifts, about the future of the Donbass. It's, it's a subject that needs more examination. Thank you so much for joining us. It's really an honor to host all of you. Again, this was co-sponsored with our friends at SIPA the Donbass Gates in Mariupol. It was the third in a series, and we'd like to thank Jock Mendoza-Wilson and SCM for making this series possible. We'll see you again next time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you, and bye. Have a good one. Thank you, you too.